So, okay, today's first session, we have two speakers, and the, the, the theme is uh, concerning about Bergson's uh, philosophy of bio biology. And so, the first speaker, uh, Tano Posteraro, uh, am I pronouncing your name correctly? <laughs> Yeah, right, actually. Okay, so, Tano and uh, uh, he he received his uh, PhD from Pennsylvania State uh, University in 2019, and his uh, his dissertation his dissertation on Arne Bergson and the philosophy of biology is currently under contract with Edinburgh University Press for will, will be published in the next year. I think. And uh, he is also a co-editor with uh, Michael Bennett of Deleuze and Evolutionary Theory, and author of a number of articles and chapters on biological themes in 20th century contemporary philosophy. So uh, let's, uh, I, I take you the mic. Great, so, thanks. Thanks, Isushi, for the interview, or the uh, introduction, rather. <laughs> um, and uh, thanks to Len and the rest of the team for putting this together under such wacky times and to Ted, of course, for taking care of the technical details. This will be the first presentation I've ever given on Zoom. So just, you know, give me a, some indication if, you know, the, the internet's cutting out or some, something like that. Hopefully this goes well enough. Um, I do have a, a few quotations uh, on a PowerPoint, so I will attempt to share my screen and hopefully that works out. Is that good? Great. Okay, so I'll just jump right in then. Um, when Whitehead wrote that the status of life in nature constituted the modern problem of both philosophy as well as science, he may well have had Bergson in mind. In this paper, I unearth a line of development that runs from Bergson through Whitehead and into modern embryology. It is well known that life is to be thought, according to Bergson, as a kind of impetus irreducible to physical determination. But Bergson insisted that this was only an image borrowed from psychology, the psychology of effort in particular, the best one available, but an image no less. Life, that is organization and evolution, is supposed to exceed any of the conceptual frames through which it could be determined. An image is required by which it can be imagined, grasped, and made sense of. This, among some other reasons, is why so many images populate and animate creative evolution. Today, I'll talk about one in particular, the canal or canalization. The fact that this image managed to find its way through Whitehead's process and reality into modern embryology via the work of C.H. Waddington has still yet to receive the appreci appreciation I think it probably deserves. Canalization continues to serve, even after Waddington, as an image for the way epigenetic landscapes, as I'll explain later, uh, operate in order to bring about or canalize a small number of results from a large number of developmental possibilities, or potentialities. Bergson's image of the canal should be of interest not only to Bergsonians or Whiteheadians, but maybe even to philosophers of biology and historians of science as well. Okay, so though any relatively attentive reading of creative evolution should yield the position that Bergson's Elan Vital is not a vital principle of the traditional variety, headway nonetheless remains to be made in its interpretation. I think that the status of the Elan Vital as an image is too often overlooked. Life, organization, and evolution is supposed to elude the binary alternative between efficient and final causality, mechanism and finalism, Bergson's terms, and so cannot be determined in the causal terms recognizable to either. Bergson suggests that it is better thought for this reason through what he calls an image instead, and of an impetus or an elan in particular. He explains why in this letter to Flores de Latka in 1936. I have the quote here on the PowerPoint that I'll read. Um, Bergson writes, the image intervenes most often because it is indispensable none of the other existing concepts being able to express the author's thought. The author is then obliged to present it suggestively. To give just one example, example when I relate the phenomena of life and ev evolution to an Elan Vital, it is in no way an ornament of style. It is even less meant to mask an images or ignorance of the deepest causes 
as when the vitalist in general invokes a vital principle. The truth is that philosophy only offers philosophers two principles of explanation in this matter, mechanism and finalism. Now the place to be is somewhere in between these two concepts. How should we determine that place? I have to point to it, to indicate it, since no concept between mechanism and finality exists. The image of an Elan is only this indication. There's of course a lot to be said about Bergson's philosophy of images, especially as it's developed in matter and memory. What I want to note for now is that images can serve, among some other things, as tools for the expression and communication of thoughts that escape the delimited boundaries of available concepts. Images point to something outside of those concepts, prompting thought to think beyond its habituated forms. Yet as tools for the expression and communication of thought, Images are also necessarily breaks or circumscriptions of thinking. I'm quoting Bergson in Mind Energy here. And so with them, he says, with images, you can no more reconstitute thinking than with positions you can make movement. While the need for an image arises when thinking outstrips the concepts that are available to it, any particular image as a satisfaction of that need is only produced, again quoting Bergson, when thinking, instead of continuing its own train, makes a pause or is reflected back on itself. The image is an interruption of the movement of thought beyond the concept. Thought then returns to the domain of concepts in order to communicate itself, enlisting the image in order not to have to settle back into any of the concepts that pre-existed it. The image is something like an unstable intermediary between the intuition of something beyond the domain of concepts and the concepts beyond which it is directed. It's a way of pointing, Bergson says. To say that the Elan Vital is an image is to say that it is a way of pointing beyond any of the already existing concepts through which it might be thought. It should not be understood, in other words, as a concept of its own with an identifiable, identifiable object of its own, like a vital force, to which it would correspond. But I want to leave that discussion to one side for now in order to consider another sort of less familiar image in creative evolution. Uh, the image of the canal, which I think functions in a similar way. This image has a kind of subterranean legacy uh, that remains underappreciated. Bergson introduces the image of the digging of a canal only briefly before appearing to replace it with his better known image of the hand thrust through iron filings. But the two images work in tandem and should not be treated independently of each other, I claim. The canal is an image for the idea that Quote, the vision of a living being is an effective vision limited to objects on which the being can act. In matter and memory, Bergson theorized the way living beings select and distribute a field of perception images on the basis of their sensory motor capacities as an operation by which the total aggregate of material images is narrowed into an actionable world of experience. In creative evolution, he describes this pragmatically limited capacity to see as, quote, a vision that is canalized. Vision, he claims, is a power which should reach in principle an infinity of things inaccessible to our eyes. Such a vision would be impractical, impractical of course, for the vital necessities of living organisms. A vision that is canalized is a vision that is trained on and contoured by the objects that are relevant for it. Canalization denotes this tapering down of a possibility space, all possibly visible objects, for some effective purpose. Before referring the canalization of effective vision to the image of the digging of a canal, Bergson, Bergson adds that the visual apparatus, quote, simply symbolizes the work of canalization. Mysterious phrase. By visual apparatus, he means the structural complexity of the organ, the eye. Vision should in principle be able to register otherwise invisible objects, but is canalized or narrowed according to what is relevant for it. The visual apparatus or eye is a product or symbol, he says, of the activity or process of canalization. Far from generating the function of vision as a capacity of its structural organization, you have an eye and then you can see, the visual apparatus is supposed to be an effect of vision instead an effect of the function. So he inverts the structure function priority. Uh, so here's the quote that I have um, pulled up there. 
Bergson says, the creation of the visual apparatus is no more explained by the assembling of its anatomic elements than the digging of a canal could be explained by the heaping up of the earth which might have formed its banks. A mechanistic theory would maintain that the earth had been brought cartload by cartload and then maybe happened to have made a canal that could uh, channel water. Finalism would add that it had not been dumped down at random, that the Carters had followed a plan. That is, they knew they wanted to make a canal in advance. But both theories would be mistaken, for the canal has been made in another way, Bergson says. <clears throat> this is all he has to say about the image. He turns afterward to the hand, submitting that, quote, the process by which nature constructs an eye, presumably analogous to that by which the canal has been made, can be fixed with greater pre precision, he says, in the image of a hand thrust through iron filings. Maybe tempting, it may seem tempting to leave the canal to one side and focus on the image of the hand instead. This move is a mistake on four counts, I think. First, the term canalization was introduced to explain the relationship between vision and the visual apparatus before the image of the canal was produced and displaced by the hand. Second, it insists, that is, the term canalization insists throughout the description of the hand, whose movement is said to be canalized by the iron filings that outline it. Third, the term canalization appears later in pivotal discussions of the thermodynamic accumulation and release of free energy in the living being. And fourth, there exists a line running from Bergson's use of the term through Whitehead's process metaphysics to the embryological theory of C.H. Waddington, and from there into mainstream embryology today. I'll just note that I, as far as I can tell, one scholar has noticed this, and that is uh, Alia Al-Saji. I'm not sure if, he's, if she's here right now. Um, in her 2010 article, Life is Vision, she refers to canalization, uh, criticizes its place in um, creative evolution as one image among some uh, superior ones, she suggests, and denies actually its continuity with the embryological term. Uh, I think she misses the Whiteheadian intermediary, and that's what I'm going to point out in this paper. Okay, so Bergson says of the canal that the process by which it was formed cannot be explained by the accumulated dirt that makes up its banks. Canals are formed in three ways, broadly speaking. I'm not an expert in canals. Uh, first is that a, ch a channel is dug into dry land through excavation and supplied with water from elsewhere. Second way is that a channel is dredged into the bottom of an already existing body of water that is subsequently drained down to the channel, down to the canal. And third, a stretch of raised banks are constructed in parallel in order to create a channel between them by outlining it. As Bergson mentions both digging as well as the heaping up of earth in the banks, we can imagine a canal, a canal of both the first and third kind. This canal seems to have had its channel dug out and its banks formed out of the dirt displaced. As a water supply is introduced into the canal, it flows through the negative space of the channel and adopts a trajectory contoured by the material structure that directs it. As a moving reality, the flow can be seen to stand in relation to the structure of the canal in a manner analogous to the relation between the banks and the channel. Whereas the negative space of the channel corresponds to the visible structure of the floor and the banks that define it, the moving reality of the canalized flow of water corresponds to the sedimented and static material composition of the canal that directs it. The process through which the canal is formed stands in the same relation to the constituted material of its structure. It is on this point that both mechanist and finalist explanations are supposed to falter. So to repeat, Bergson says, mechanism would maintain that the earth had been brought cartload by cartload. Finalism would add that it had not been dumped down at random, that the Carters had followed a plan. Both agree in attending only to the finished material of the canal, and so doing, they miss the process responsible for its formation. While that process, the digging out of its floor, consists primarily in the generation of the negative space of the channel, its only visible material effects are embodied in the floor and banks around it. Both positions mistake what are the visible products of an invisible process of formation for its real component parts. The canal is explained fully when its material structures also refer to the process of canalizing that it facilitates. The sedimented materiality of the canal figures both as the material product of the process of its formation 
and is the material substrate for the canalizing of a flow of water. The image of the canal in, you know, in some, I'll stop talking about it soon, depicts the distinction between process of formation, product, material structure, illustrating the irreducibility of the former to the latter, and it is an image that depicts the reincorporation of product of the canal into the process of canalizing in turn. After asserting that both the canal and the eye have been made in a way that eludes the resources of mechanism and finalism, Bergson replaces the image of the canal with the image of a hand. He introduces the second image by adding the idea of resistance to a familiar image from his previous texts, the example of just raising one's hand in the air. Let us now imagine, he says, that instead of moving in air, the hand has to pass through iron filings, which are compressed and offer resistance to it in proportion as it goes forward. By offering resistance, the filings, Bergson says, canalize the trajectory of the hand by limiting its motion and exhausting the effort required to push any further. So you're shoving your hand into iron filings. At some point, you can't push any further. Filings restrict your hand. We're told to imagine that the outline of the hand remains preserved in the arrangement of the filings wherever it stops. And finally, to imagine that the hand and arm are invisible. The result is a mass of iron filings coordinated around the silhouette of an absent hand. This image is analogous to the canal in the bifurcation between its material configuration and the invisible process responsible for it. The coordinated filings should not be thought as a causally inert representation of the hand's final position. The reason why the image involves iron filings and not a more plastic medium is because the filings resist the hand plunged into them, canalizing its movement and exerting a causal influence on the trajectory taken by it. The filings can be conceived both as the product of a canalized process and sorry, the product of a canalized process and as the material substrate for the canalization of that process. The distinction between process and product is at least partially bidirectional. The filings are a spatialized expression of the trajectory taken through them, as well as ingredient factors in the calibration of that trajectory itself. Bergson proposes that, <clears throat> quote, the relation of vision to the visual apparatus would be on his hypothesis, very nearly that of the hand to the iron filings that follow, canalize and limit its motion. So that's the quote that's up there. If it is the act of vision that is canalized, then it is the physiology of the visual system that canalizes it. The structure of the visual system as the material substrate for the canalization of, vi of vision is what explains the pragmatic efficacy of vision in the living being. The living being sees in its environment only what is meaningful for it as an effect of its body's material constraints on and delimitations of what it would otherwise be possible to see. Canalization is both limitation and facilitation at the same time. And to put it otherwise, limitation is facilitation's material means. <clears throat> if vision is canalized by the visual apparatus, then any attempt to explain the composition of the apparatus on the basis of its structure alone would be akin to mistaking the constituted banks of a canal for the process through which the canal was dug. When Bergson calls the material, materiality of the organ, quote, a negation rather than a positive reality, he means that the organ is the spatialized outline of the process of its formation, reflecting the positive reality of its genesis and inverse by silhouetting it. The greater the hand's effort, the further will be its trajectory through the filings that resist it. This is Bergson's model for vision as well. For the visual organ's sophistication, its degree of complexity, stands in direct proportion to the effort or advancement of, quote, the undivided act constituting vision. The tendency toward vision canalizes the visual apparatus, to put it otherwise. Materiality of the organ, this is a quote again from Creative Evolution. Materiality of the organ of the eye is made up of a more or less considerable number of mutually coordinated elements in direct proportion to how far the undivided act constituting vision was able to realize itself. The structure of the visual apparatus corresponds in its complexity to the intensity of the, of the function embodied in it. While structures are always concrete and individual, differing from each other in the coordination of their component parts, the function of vision is an undivided act whose advance and intensity is realized across structures of increase in complexity. The specific, specific form of each visual apparatus only expresses the extent to which the exercise of the evolutionary function has been obtained. 
behind all the visual apparatuses of the animal kingdom, from gastropods and spiders to cephalopods and mammals, there's one tendency, one movement, one elan. Evolution is canalized in the direction of vision, just that is, as it is canalized in the direction of indetermination. Both ends are canalized by the structures that facilitate them. Bergson's discussion of thermodynamics, he suggests that the tendency towards indetermination, which is how he defines life, <clears throat> the alain vital, can be understood on the basis of its physiological canalization through the metabolic processes that afford the animal its latitude of possible actions in response to external stimuli. This tendency is canalized subjectively as well via the sensorial presentation of choice to consciousness, contoured by the material means by which visual information is captured, processed, and converted to the visual images in which possibilities for action are instantiated. For any of evolution's ends, any of its tendencies, there's a process of canalization that works to constrain and facilitate their realization. Trends, patterns, and convergences are the result of canalization. Canalization is everywhere, that is my idea. By the end of creative evolution, it is concentration and trendedness that comes to comprise canalization's primary sense. With some qualifications, it is this sense that is retained by the use of the term canalization in the embryology of today. It was most likely Whitehead who first discerned in Bergson's image the value of this aspect in particular. The question of the extent to which Bergson played an influential role in the development of Whitehead's philosophy of organism has been the, sum, has been the subject of some debate since Northrop declared Bergson the chief resource for the basic concept and doctrine of Whitehead's entire philosophical outlook. Northrop identified Wilden Carr's 1912 monograph, Bergson, The Philosophy of Change, as the most likely intermediary between the two. The critical response to this suggestion is exemplified by Victor Lowe, who argues that Bergson exerted little to no positive influence on Whitehead, seeing the two thinkers as having developed some broadly similar general commitments independently. But none of the scholars who pay attention to the relationship between Bergson and Whitehead address the idea of canalization. Neither do any of the other critics of the idea of Bergson's influence on Whitehead. Whitehead introduced the term canalization in the principle of relativity to emphasize the productive dimensions of limitation attributing to Bergson both the word and the insight as well. Though Whitehead did not elaborate its details initially in 1922, the term reappeared throughout process and reality, serving there as an essential factor in the explanation of the emergence of order. And again, he uh, attributes, it, attributes it to Bergson. According to Whitehead's use of it, canalization is a primarily positive process. The material of a canalized process should be understood not as the process's negative or spatialized outline, but as the means by which it was progressively tapered, becoming increasingly irreversible over time. Whitehead thus conceived of canalization as a general metaphysical principle capable of explaining everything from gene expression to the order required for the, ma the maturation of a personality. It might not be that surprising that Whitehead saw something powerful in Bergson's image of the canal. What he saw was the insight that cre creativity can only realize itself within the confines of material bodies. Without material breaks, constraints on its tendency to differentiate, evolution would be able to produce nothing stable at all, nothing on which natural selection could act. That wouldn't be a victory won on behalf of creativity, but a failure, for totally unrestricted variation wouldn't be productive as much as, cha as chaotic, all experimentation and no artwork. It is this generative sense to canalization that Whitehead affirms and develops, it supplies order, which is required for creativity and an increase in what Whitehead calls intensity. Whitehead emphasizes the way Bergson utilizes the image at the end of creative evolution as a mechanism for the concentration and intensification of diffuse and vague activity. Whitehead recodes the idea of productive concentration in the terms of his own system. In Whitehead's formulation, canalization refers to the prehension of an inherited past of consolidated acts and relations. As the organism develops, it integrates more and more of its relations and transmits those integrations along a temporal line. The organism doesn't have to constantly decide how to relate to the world. In some sense, the outlines of its relation are increasingly rigidified for it, which implies a certain degree of irreversibility, just as it implies a developmental tapering in the space of possibilities. 
Okay. Canalization uh, is supposed to supply the mechanism uh, of the explanation for unity and continuity in the development of organic life for Whitehead. There's a lot of other things to say about Whitehead, which I'd be happy to talk about uh, in the Q&A, but we'll push along a little bit to get to the point here. So C.H. Waddington, uh, there he is, a developmental biologist responsible for initiating the conceptual revolution in life sciences known now as systems biology, and sometimes considered the father of modern epigenetics, elaborated his theory of the epigenetic landscape and its branching pathways of development while reading Whitehead's Science in the Modern World and Process and Reality. So he's actually apparently uh, inspired to drop out of geology and pursue biology after reading Whitehead. Um, his initial paper on Whitehead and biology, philosophy and biology, uh, which he wrote for a essay prize, actually uh, already involves a lot of what would become his most important contributions to embryology. And it's a paper on Whitehead, mostly. Waddington drew on Whitehead's reformulation of the image of the canal as the means by which to explain organismic order in the midst of environmental variability. He, he sought an explanation for the reliable production of similar phenotypes in a highly variable population scattered across significantly different environments. Waddington imagined a plane into which several divergent canals have taken shape. What flows through them on his account is not a tendency in the process of realizing itself as it was for Bergson, but according to a certain secularization of Bergson, the cell instead. Before becoming canalized along one line of development, the cell's fate is plastic, can follow any of a number of pathways, each of which is contoured by the interactions of various genes. Here we have uh, Waddington's images of the canal. The little balls that you see there are supposed to be uh, the cell in the process of developing, could sort of fit into any groove, fall into any groove. Once the cell begins to develop along certain trajectories, it gains an expression, what Whitehead called intensity, what it loses in plasticity or, you know, uh, potentiality uh, for different kinds of expression. Developmental irreversibility is the key to Waddington's formulation of the image. Becoming canalized means falling into a groove, taking one pathway of development at the expense of initially possible others. Here again is another set of images. Developmental reactions, in Waddington's words, I'm quoting him, are in general canalized so as to bring about one end result regardless of minor variations and conditions during the course of the reaction. It was on the basis of Whitehead's redeployment of Bergson's image of the canal that Waddington developed a theory of epigenetics that, as Adam Wilkins has recently suggested, was nothing short of a premature discovery. Uh, in this image, Waddington sort of lays out his uh, epigenetic view of development according to the way a, a canal would be kind of um, formed on the basis of uh, gene expression. Bergson had generalized canalization across evolutionary history, employing it as an image for the way tendencies are channeled and embodied through a series of complex forms. Whitehead made that image into a principle for the production of novelty on the basis of ordered, limited, concentrated creativity. Waddington encoded the insight in his formulation of cellular development. It remains important to the history and theory of epigenetic stability today. Okay, by way of conclusion, I wanna to return to what I said about images at the outset. On the one hand, images are spatializations or halts. They cannot capture the complexity of the phenomena for which they are images, and they do not purport to. I should say that uh, Waddington's images of uh, the canal and canalization do not correspond to anything in uh, cellular biology. They're purely heuristic. They don't pretend to correspond to anything. Uh, on the other hand, so images cannot capture the complexity of the phenomena for which they are images. On the other hand, they are helpful simplifications that point beyond themselves, using their own limits as resources for communicating more of whatever it is that they depict. There's a kind of structural analogy between the image and what it images and life and its material del delimitations. Life itself, so to speak, might be thought according to the model of the image. 
The evolutionary movement is spatialized across a series of individual bodies. Organic bodies are the delimited cessations to the creative impulse that images are to the material whole in the ontological past and matter and memory. There is a relationship that obtains between the logic of life and the inability of the image to exhaust its explanandum. Or yet again, between the relation of life to living things and the relation of perceptual images to the universal whole. Scientific analysis is also structurally analogous to perceptual experience as each operates by isolating a thing from its relations and dividing a whole into parts. Understood in this context, the image of the canal might occupy a particularly interesting position in Bergson's understanding of life. This is a, a I pulled up a quote from C.H. Waddington's um, prize essay, Philosophy and Biology. He sounds very Whiteheadian and very uh, Bergsonian in this quote. I'll just leave it up there while I conclude. The canal as an image for the relation between life and matter is an image, halt or space light, spatialization, deployed as a means by which to explain precisely the same limitation imposed on life by matter. In its negative valence, the canal is an image that is turned against itself. Canalization is supposed to show that what is essential about vital forms cannot be captured spatially without recourse to the moving reality or invisible tendency that organizes them. Yet it is supposed to accomplish this as an image, characterized by the same spatializing operation that, is, that it is implemented in order to address. The image of the canal is a spatialization of thought intended to demonstrate the inadequacy of spatialized thinking. Like the filings, it outlines its object in negative relief. That may not be coincidental. It might even reveal something about Bergson's view of the scientific study of living things. Just as life needs the matter that limits it in order to realize itself, we need images in order to think, even if through them we always fall short of our objects of thought. Images of life are far from necessary evils. They are also potentially productive ingredients in the development of scientific theory in their own right. Science makes use of spatialization, analytic and experimental isolation, delimitation, and so on. These are features of imagistic cognition. Life cannot be studied apart from its images, but these images may work best when they can be turned back on themselves, made to reveal how they are functioning as images and what their limitations are. So I want to conclude with a distinction made by Peter Godfrey Smith, philosopher biology Peter Godfrey Smith, between philosophies of science and nature, and to suggest that both Bergson and Whitehead are situating the philosophy of science within the philosophy of nature delineating its boundaries in accordance with the limits of imagistic thought. While the philosopher of science attends on Godfrey Smith's account to the specificities of some domain of research, its requisite boundaries, presuppositions, and operative images, the philosopher of nature, quote, comments on the overall picture of the natural world that science and perhaps other types of inquiry seem to be giving us. Where the scientific thinker makes use of helpful images, expedient categorizations, and distinctions in the service of some research program, the philosopher of nature should feel no such obligation. This philosopher comes in a certain sense after empirical research and tries to synthesize its findings with insights generated by other investigations in other domains in order to do as much, as much justice as possible to the global complexity of the situation. Often this is unhelpful, even paralyzing for scientific research. Science has to delimit, cordon, and isolate but the philosopher of nature has concerns over and above research feasibility and experimental purchase. Bergson and Whitehead should be understood as philosophers of nature in this sense. Their philosophies function both as commentaries on the findings generated by the sciences of their time, as well as attempts to supplement those findings with theories that remained foreclosed to the methodologies of the sciences. If Bergson's Elan Vital and Whitehead's primordial creativity are part of a philosophy of nature, then their use of the image of the canal might signal the role played by a philosophy of science. The life sciences proceed by decomposing the living world into graspable parts that are conducive to analytic manipulation. That is also how images work. They isolate and delimit for some purpose in service of some end. So too for science, which means that it should be located within a philosophy of nature whose sphere is wider and indeed metaphysical. By tracing embryology's concept of canalization back to the image of the canal as it is situated in both Bergson and Whitehead within a larger field of activity, of temporality, creativity, and life, I try to indicate one way in which these thinkers recommend a philosophy of science concomitant with a philosophy of nature that will always nonetheless necessarily outstrip it. Thanks. 
Thank you. Thank you very much for the excellent presentation. <laughs> and uh, so uh, I, I I think the Q and session will be the, together after after the second speaker. So so we go to the directory to the second speaker, uh, Emily Herring. Uh, hello. So and she completed her PhD in the history and the philosophy of science at the University of Leeds early this year and her dissertation was on the reception of Bergson's philosophy among British biologists. She is now postdoc at the University uh, of Ghent in Belgium and in her research she continues to study Bergson's influence on 20th century biology and the philosophy of biology. So uh, let's listen to her talk. Uh, ah, so she is also very famous about her Twitter. <laughs> uh, we all know about that. Okay. <laughs> yes, and there's also a, a, a Bergson Society Twitter um, at Ami de Bergson that you can follow. Uh, thank you so much for the introduction. Thank you so much for organizing this. It's so nice to see all of you and hear all of you. Um, I'll get right to it. So. Um, in 1926, uh, French philosopher Jacques Chevalier was preparing a series of lectures on Bergson's philosophy, and he had the luxury of asking Bergson himself to check his preparatory notes. Um, and in the section about Bergson's 1907 bestseller, Creative Evolution, Chevalier had written um, in his notes that most biologists had relegated the élan vital to the status of useless entities. And Bergson was quick to note that this point was not quite correct, telling Chevalier that creative evolution was well received and even used by a number of biologists. But do we um, take Bergson's word for it? Most historians of science certainly do not. Um, the main historiographical attitude towards Bergson's reception in biology um, has been that Bergson played little to no role um, in the theorizing or practice of 20th century biologists, which is surprising given not only Bergson's renown, but the fact that he deals with a number of very important um, biological texts of the time in creative evolution. Um, and one of the recent examples of this is in Nicholson and Gorn, uh, historians and philosophers of biology who write that most biologists did not bother to discuss Bergson's views, not even to criticize them. Um, and this uh, idea is found in, in, in varying degrees of uh, intensity in, in works of people like Peterson and, and also in Provine and, and other people. Um, in this talk, I'm going to side with Bergson and, and challenge this dominant historiographical uh, view and try to show that Bergson's legacy within biology is of greater importance than um, the historiography currently shows. So today I'm going to be focusing mostly on, on Britain. Uh, which is, um, I focused on Britain in my, in my PhD thesis and, and in a, my postdoc project that I've just started this month, um, I'll be examining the US and French uh, cases and also I'll be going beyond the early decades of the 20th century, which is what I had focused on previously. Um, and so today I'm going to look a little bit at two important 20th century debates on, so first, um, the vitalism mechanism debate in the, in the early 20th century, and then um, questions surrounding evolution. So unsurprisingly, perhaps, given Bergson's theoretical um, commitments in creative evolution, we find many biologists looking to Bergson uh, for arguments against mechanistic explanations for vital phenomena. Um, why were biologists looking for arguments um, against mechanistic biology in the early 20th century? Um, well, in the early decades of the 20th century, many biologists were expressing concerns about the use of the methods of, and concepts of uh, physics and chemistry within the life sciences. And these biologists criticized mechanistic thinking, the, the mechanists who claimed that biological phenomena were best explained by reducing organisms to their physico-chemical elements. The anti-mechanists believed that mechanists failed to account for many of the complex specificities of, of life. Um, and they also feared that not only um, mechanism was just a bad way of studying life, but that it would 
if it prevailed, um, it would result in biology losing its relatively new theoretical and institutional autonomy as a science um, and become a sort of sub-discipline of physics. So there was a lot at stake um, and in a kind of um, caricatural way, you can represent these um, debates as an opposition between, there are two extreme cases, let's say on, on one end of the spectrum, you have Jacques Loeb, a German embryologist who uh, says in a, in a conference in 1911 that ultimately life uh, can be explained unequivocally in physical chemical terms. Um, and then on the other end of the spectrum, you have Hans Driesch, another German embryologist um, who looks very disappointed in all of you in, in this photo um, and whose experiments on the development of sea urchins had led him to believe that embryonic development was guided by a dynamic teleological immaterial and internal agency he called the entelechy. And so Nicholson and Gorn, whom I've already mentioned, um, argue along with others, including Stephen Jay Gould and, and others, um, that Loeb and Drisch were actually special cases and that most early 20th century biologists didn't hold such extreme positions, um, but most adopted a middle ground position that avoided the pitfalls of both um, mechanism and vitalism, um, that these middle ground thinkers rejected the reduction of the vital to the physico-chemical, but at the same time rejected um, the use of an untestable vital force like the entelechy. And on this point, I agree, it's true that the Loeb and Riesch represent kind of extreme cases, but uh, what I disagree with is the way in which, in particular here, um, Nicholson and Gorn use this point to then uh, draw conclusions about how Bergson was received. So for various reasons, um, including the fact that Riesch himself published a favorable review of creative evolution, Bergson and Riesch's positions have for over a century now been, been read as identical. Um, often they're just presented together as the same. Um, and so, and this continues to get to uh, today as well. And again, I'm, I'm, I'm quoting Nicholson and Gunn who say, um, Bergson and Riesch were the last outspoken advocates of a dying creed and they, and they represent them as very much um, presenting a similar kind of, of philosophy or idea about life. And because Bertin has been traditionally depicted as one of the chief vitalists in this way, um, narratives like those presented by Nicholson and Gorn have therefore presupposed that most biologists rejected Bertin as a theoretical extremist, because as we've seen, most of them were middle, trying to propose a third way view that were middle ground thinkers. Um, we know that this association between Bertin and Riche is problematic uh, from reading Bertin himself. And, um, but um, this kind of sticks, and this is one of the reasons, well, this is one of the arguments were, um, used by those who claim that Bergson had no impact on biology. Either he was seen as a, as a theoretical extremist or those who did follow him were actually followers of a school of thought that was already bound for obsolescence at the time uh, in the early 20th century. But what, what I found by looking closely at the works of biologists from this time is that among the biologists who turned to Bergson to find ammunition against physico-chemical reductionism and mechanism is that many of them are precisely those who saw themselves as proposing a third way view, neither vitalism nor mechanism. And their approaches rarely invoke the élan vital, but rather they rest upon two, um, two main arguments, two main ideas that are taken from Bergson, adapted from Bergson. Um, so the first one is the, the idea of the temporality of organisms. Um, the idea that organisms endure. Um, and this is used as an argument for the irreducibility of, of organisms and therefore the autonomy of biology. The idea is that biology has to be an independent discipline because there are phenomena that only the methods of biology can study. Um, it's both a kind of epistemological and ontological argument. It works both ways and you find both in, in various people. But Here's one example, we have Edward Stuart Russell, uh, an important thinker of 20th century or organicism um, and of theoretical biology writing. An organism is above all a historical being. This fundamental fact alone is enough to absolutely distinguish between the biological and the physical sciences. In organisms, the past is always interwoven to a certain extent with the present. We could say, borrowing Bergson's expression, 
the past is extended into the present. Therefore, living beings must be explained by their history. And we find the same idea in the writing of uh, another British biologist and science writer, John Arthur Thompson. And I, I won't read out the quote uh, for lack of time, but I'll leave it up there for a second. Um, the second idea that I found a lot in biologists who are mobilizing Bergson against mechanistic thinking is um, the idea expressed by Bergson in Creative Evolution that um, intelligence is characterized by a natural incomprehension of life. So biologists use this idea um, to, some, to, to resist um, mechanistic thinking by saying, actually, this way of thinking is flawed. Um, so here's a really interesting example. Um, a British geneticist called Arthur Derbyshire, who has a great photo, a great profile photo for his, uh, for his Twitter, um, who very um, calmly called creative evolution the greatest event so far in the history of thought in the 20th century. So this was in 1915, so maybe it doesn't have the impact, uh, but still, it's pretty, that's pretty enthusiastic. Um, and who, according to him, um, scientists reject any theory which follows the fluid and mobile inclination of reality and are naturally drawn to theories which follow the natural mechanistic inclination of human intelligence. And he goes one step further than Bergson and he writes, we have therefore an argument for the view that the acceptability of a theory is evidence not of the accuracy with which that theory fits the phenomenon, um, but of its remoteness from it. So for Derbyshire Bergson's evolutionary explanation of the origins and the limits of human, the human intellect can be used as a kind of demarcation criterion to decide between good or bad theories. Um, the fact that we find a theory appealing should, according to him, alert us to the fact that it's probably not a very good theory in biology. Um, and in biology, the more a theory appeals naturally to us, the further probably it is from the truth. He, he really says this in, in, um, in this book, um, An Introduction to a Biology. So, and, and we have something similar with, again, this is E.S. Russell um, in a letter to uh, his friend, the American geneticist Raymond Pearl. Um, he writes about his deep-seated doubt whether the human intelligence is really capable of understanding the universe in more than a somewhat superficial way, blah, blah, blah. This is largely Bergsonism. I am much impressed by his view that the human mind is a rather feeble instrument when it comes to dealing with life and mind. He is certainly right when he regards it as adapted to dealing with matter and mathematics. But when we contemplate the facts of development and regulation, they seem in some way to be beyond our grasp. Um, so the idea is that we're, we're drawn to mechanistic explanations in biology because they're more appealing, they're easier to wrap our heads around, but they prevent us from understanding fully our biological object of study. And these biologists, like, this is something I found in, in quite a few cases, they're aware that they're in some, in some sense stuck with um, conceptual knowledge, scientific knowledge. Um, but for them, the, the very fact of being aware of these obstacles constitute a form of progress and are the first step in rethinking new foundations for new philosophical foundations really for um, to ensure that biology remain autonomous. So that was the first sort of set of debates that I wanted to look at. I now want to look quickly at, well quickly, we'll see, um, at um, questions to do with evolution. Um, and so again, given Bergson's theoretical commitments, uh, in particular his critique of natural selection in the first chapter of Creative Evolution, it, it doesn't necessarily come as a surprise to find um, supporters of Bergson among anti-Darwinian biologists. And I found a lot of them, um, including all of these people. So you have Russell and Derbyshire and Thompson we've already seen. And then these are the other two, uh, two French neo-Lamarckians. Um, called uh, Pierre-Paul Grasset and Albert Vandel. Um, I won't go into any detail here at all because, uh, but the, it, the idea in, in one sentence, the, the general idea is that na the theory of natural selection fails um, to account for the creativity and spontaneity at play in evolution. It falls under the category of a, of a mechanistic um, theory. This is, this is broadly what these people are saying. Um, 
and I can say more about them in the questions if you want, but I think it would be way more interesting to look at the more surprising cases, um, the Darwinian Ber Bergsonians, because there are a few. Um, the big neo-Darwinian movement of the 20th century that has come to be known as the modern synthesis, um, which put simply designates the combination of Mendelian genetics and the theory of natural selection through a collective international effort. Um, it's usually represented as this kind of, well, at least in, in certain parts of the historiography, it's, it's often represented as this kind of mechanistic enterprise, um, something that is therefore incompatible with a Bergsonian view of evolution. Um, and there's one exception actually in the, in the historiography, and this is Jean, this very important article by Jean Gaillon. Um, but the idea is that Berton had little to no impact on the architects of the modern synthesis. That's, that, that's to the exception of Jean Gaillon, that's basically what you find. Um, or that if he did have an impact, it was during the early career of these architects and therefore when they didn't know any better and then they went onto a more serious Darwinian path. And this is very much how Julian Huxley is depicted. Um, so Julian Huxley, grandson of Thomas Huxley, Darwin's bulldog, uh, brother of Aldous Huxley um, and many other famous Huxleys. Um, and he's the person who coined the expression uh, modern synthesis. He's a zoologist, a science popularizer, uh, a broadcaster, among many other things. Um, and to those of you who've already heard me speak, I'm sorry, because I do often speak about Huxley. But the reason is, is, is because he's a very interesting case uh, for me, um, because he's so often used to illustrate the fact that biologists were not interested in Bethson, um, when actually it's, it's quite the opposite. Um, because he appropriated and adapted Bergsonian ideas and he injected them into three of the main themes um, he developed in his career, so progressive evolution, eugenics, and animal behavior. Um, and I'll only have time to look at the first point, but I'd like to spend a little bit of time with Huxley because I think he, he's really interesting and surprising. Um, so in 1912, he published his first book, uh, The Individual in the Animal Kingdom, in which he developed his theory of evolutionary progress for the first time and acknowledged that his ideas were heavily inspired by Bertrand's philosophy. And in the introduction, he writes, it will easily be seen how much I owe to Monsieur Bergson, who, whether one agrees or not with his views, has given a stimulus, most valuable gift of all to biology and philosophy alike. And so in this book, he, Huxley dealt with the philosophical problem of individuality from a biological perspective. Um, and Huxley thought that Bergson had done a good job of addressing this issue in, in creative evolution. Um, he thought that rather than proposing a rigid definition of individuality, which couldn't account for the diversity of life, Bergson characterized it in ter terms of tendency. And so Huxley paraphrases Bergson in the introduction again, um, writing the major portion of this book is devoted to showing that living matter always tends to group itself into these closed independent systems with harmonious parts. And for Huxley, one of the main tendencies of life was to strive towards whole, wholeness, a, a certain form of internal harmony by which the different parts of the system work to, or of the organism work together and towards the conservation of the whole and of the kind. And he links this, um, his idea of evolutionary progress to his idea of individuality. So for him, evolutionary progress is something that can be measured through um, increased independence from the environment. Um, the more options an organism is able to consider and to choose from in any given situation, the more independent it is. Um, and this is especially achieved through the complexification of the nervous system, through the differentiation of parts, um, like a sort of division of labor. And so these are themes that Bergson um, had developed in, in creative evolution and summarized in life and consciousness. And so Huxley claims that there exists um, almost an infinity of, of degrees of consciousness from primitive organisms in which perception and action are mashed together in immediate reflexes to more complex organisms whose um, nervous systems allow for a sort of division and lab of labor 
uh, between nerves and brain and so therefore allow recollection of past perceptions and anticipation of, of future situations through choices based on these recollections. And Huxley's vision of progressive um, evolution rested upon on this idea, but it, it also was Bergsonian in the sense that um, he viewed evolution as directed towards more and more effective forms of liberation um, of life and consciousness from material constraints. Um, and he also very much subscribed to the idea that evolution was creative, um, unpredictable, that there was no predetermined goal. Um, so progress didn't mean um, that there was a goal to the progress. It was very much open um, and that change was an internal process. And so this vision of progressive evolution that Huxley defends throughout his career uh, remains very close to the Bergsonian vision he developed in his first book in 1912. In his famous um, 1942 book, Evolution, the Modern Synthesis, Huxley maintains the Bergsonian elements of his progressive evolution, even though in this book he is critical of Bergson, and that's what um, a lot of people note. If you read the last chapter of the book, which is devoted to evolutionary progress, it is, it remains, um, it, it's the same depiction of evolutionary progress as the one you find in um, his first book. Um, the main difference between Bergson and Huxley, obviously, is that the motor of progressive creative evolution for Huxley is a form of Darwinian pressure, it's natural selection. Um, and I'll get back to that in a bit. But as I said, there, there are other aspects of Huxley's appropriation of Bergson's ideas, which I don't have time to develop um, in detail, but I'll just mention um, Huxley's career was marked by a prolonged commitment to a certain vision of eugenics. Um, he was a vocal member of the British Eugenics Society. Uh, well uh, throughout the late into the 20th century. And he also explicitly linked the idea of Bergsonian creative evolution to the idea of humans taking creative control over their own evolution. And um, I can say more about that if, if you want later. Um, and Huxley also used Bergsonian ideas about sympathy and evolution to think about how to study animal minds um, which is, this is quite noticeable in a, in a paper about great crested grebes um, that is still considered a po important today in, in animal behavior studies, but I don't have time to develop these points. But the point is we have um, Huxley's most important ideas heavily informed by Bergson's theories about life and its evolution. Um, why then is Huxley so often used as an example of anti bergson Bergsonism among biologists. Um, one of the reasons is that he has a very, there's a very quotable passage um, in one of his 1923 articles titled Progress Biological and Other, where he describes Bergson as a good poet but a bad scientist. And he argues that the Elan Vital was as bad an explanation for evolution as the Elan Locomotive would be for explaining the complex engineering of a train. Um, and this does seem quite damning, but if you actually read the article, um, you find that in the same passage, just after calling Bergson a bad scientist and just before deriding the explanatory power of the Elan Vital, Huxley praises Bergson's philosophical insight, writing, Bergson's intellectual vision of evolution as a fact, as something happening, something whole, to be apprehended in a unitary way that is unsurpassed. He seems to see it as vividly as you or I might see a hundred yards race, holding its different incidents and movements all in his mind together to form one picture. Huxley's, so Huxley's comment about Bergson being a good poet, I, I seriously think um, should not be understood as a sarcastic attempt to discredit Bergson's philosophy. I think it should be taken quite literally. Um, Huxley himself had been writing poetry since his teenage years. He actually opens this article with one of his own poems in which he muses about his own intellectual vision of cosmic as well as uh, biological evolution. And in his personal notes from around this time, he refers to the Elan Vital as a useful descriptive term um, whose evocative powers bear witness to Bergson's talent, talent 
in Huxley's words, his poet's eye. Um, he does say that the élan vital is too vague to convey, I quote, matters of cold fact, um, and that the explanation for evolution can be found in a form of Darwinian pressure. Um, but I do think that before coming up with the phrase modern synthesis, Huxley had operated another synthesis um, between Darwin and Bergson, and, and this synthesis is summed up by Huxley in one of, again, one of his personal notebooks where I found that he had scribbled, um, great is Darwin and Bergson his poet. Um, so this, this leads me to think that he didn't necessarily favor Darwin over Bergson at one point in his career. The, the usual narrative is that when he was young, he, was, he found Bergson really exciting and then he got into more, he got more serious and then just became a proper Darwinian. I think he operated a kind of synthesis. Um, for him, the élan vital described what was in need of an explanation, the progressive movement of evolution. The image of the élan vital stretched beyond biology, providing insights into evolution understood as a universal movement, as well as into the purpose and meaning of human life. And then Darwinism, on the other hand, provides, according to Huxley, much needed scientific tools to explain the general trends of progressive evolution. Um, so the science can inform the poetical insights of the philosopher and Bergson's intuitive methods could inform science by giving a direction to scientific research. Um, so I know I've said a lot of things about a lot of different things, but I'm going to try and conclude. Um, I think it would be it would be a shame to not look at this platypus skeleton. And also, it would be wrong to say with Nicholson and Gorn that biologists were not interested in Bergson. Many biologists um, adopted and adapted Bergson's philosophy of durée uh, in the context of their various areas of research. And the word adapted is important because as we've seen with Darvish and with Huxley, um, these biologists often took liberties with what they did with Bergson's ideas in, in the case of eugenics or Darvish's weird epistemology. Um, it can't be said either that uh, the biologists who liked Bergson only liked the him because they were themselves representatives of some sort of dying uh, school of thought, uh, vitalistic creed. Um, this is not the case with Huxley. Uh, it's not the case with Edward Stuart Russell. Uh, it's not the case with um, another Darwinian, Ronald Fisher. Um, there are articles by Jean Gaillon and John Hodge that show that one of his obsessions was to show that evolution was non-deterministic and that um, he, to some extent, used Bergson. Um, it's also not the case with uh, Conway Lloyd, Lloyd Morgan, who uh, is a very important animal behaviorist, um, animal psychologist, but who, who, who came up with the notion of emergent evolution. And Again, he in part attributes this to Bergson, and I can say more about this if you want as well. Um, but I'll just end by saying that um, I, I, to having studied quite a lot of biologists, it appears, it seems to me that one of the reasons why Bergson has been ignored by so many historians of science is because 20th century science is still being read as um, belonging to this time of extreme specialization, a time when science and philosophy were completely institutionally or, or sort of the, the, their separation was being cemented um, and defin definitive. And what a lot of historians I think have failed to see is that many scientists resisted this trend towards specialization. Um, and in fact, many of these scientists were biologists for people like Huxley and, and Derbyshire and Russell and others, the, the trend towards specialization needed to be resisted precisely because they were biologists. And by the very nature of their research, um, they believed that biology was a philosophical science, that it exceeded the boundaries of science, that the tools of science only allowed them to go so far and that they needed philosophical insights. They also needed the insights of psychology, sometimes theology. Um, and to many of these thinkers, Bergson was important because his philosophy captured this possibility and the ne necessity of knowledge behind, uh, beyond cold scientific facts. So to them, Bergson had raised the status of 
their science by not by making it more like physics, but by making it the philosophical science. Um, and so taking Bergson seriously in the context of the history of biology allows us to gain very important and interesting insights into the complex relationship between science and philosophy in the 20th century and perhaps beyond. Um, thank you very much. Thank you. So thank you for thank you very much for the nice presentations. And, and we have so around uh, 20, 25 minutes there for a question. So uh, please raise hand and already we have already two uh, comments or raise hand. So the first, uh, Hisashi, you have a question for. So uh, can you, oh, okay, okay, unmute yourself, okay. Okay, uh, thank you very much for both. Uh, it was great to hear these uh, papers. And um, I have a question uh, for uh, Tano. Um, so I totally uh, agree uh, with your uh, view, uh, with the importance for Bergsonian philosophy of estimating accurately the force of the images uh, which Bergson uses with precise uh, strategies. I myself wrote uh, some articles like uh, Bergson's hand uh, in the journal uh, Substance when Len was uh, in Texas. Um, but at the same time, uh, I would like to underline uh, the fact uh, that he talks about uh, the importance of uh, plurality of uh, images. Uh, so I would like to hear your view uh, concerning uh, what lacked uh, in the image of uh, canalization. Uh, because uh, this image, if, if I understand well, uh, does not express uh, fully uh, an event eventual uh, contribution uh, from the side of the matter, matière. Um, because uh, it, uh, as uh, you showed well uh, with the pictures of uh, canalization, so uh, the matter is in this image uh, is uh, uh, always uh, described as something uh, which is influenced by the force of uh, the, 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 the other elements. So, um, uh, so uh, uh, in order to feel uh, in this luck, uh, Bergson uses, for example, uh, the image of uh, for example, with an uh, expression with uh, uh, like uh, uh, elastic uh, canalization or uh, elastic uh, 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 flexibility, for example. And uh, uh, to fill in this uh, lack, uh, I think he uses also uh, other images, like, for example, uh, uh, myself, uh, I, I uh, paid attention to uh, the expression, the vast springboard. Uh, I think th this image, uh, this kind of image, uh, like the, the vast uh, springboard, uh, can express, can uh, how to say, fill in uh, the lack of other images. So, uh, how you uh, consider uh, this kind of plurality of images? Uh, uh, yes, it's, it's my question. Great, thanks, Sasashi. Uh, yeah, I know your um, your paper on Bergson's hand. Uh, well, and it figured into a, a larger version uh, of this presentation initially. Um, yeah, this is a good question. I think typical way of reading it is that it presents matter. I think um, Alia Asaji in her paper suggests that the canal is a kind of just mirror or sort of like inert residue of the work uh, of vital tendency or organizing force or something like this. And that's a problem because matter, of course, contributes something positive. Um, life and matter are in a kind of dynamic reciprocal interaction throughout creative evolution. And so there are other images that maybe better capture that. For me, I think that matter does have a contribution to make in the image of the canal. And I was at pains to kind of point that out. What does it contribute? It contributes a facilitating matter as a sort of constraint actually facilitates concent concentration and higher expression, which is how Whitehead reads, reads canalization, right? So the fact that the banks of a canal 
uh, constrict and channel the flow of water is actually what allows an intensification uh, and directedness uh, to take place in that flow. And that's a positive contribution made by the facilitating structure. And I think that's how to understand Bergson's view uh, on the uh, view of the um, relationship between the eye and vision. The uh, material structure of the eye sort of constrains and focuses the function of vision uh, on what's relevant for it. Now, obviously, given my view of his philosophy of images, which is that they are always sort of heuristic, um, incomplete simplifications, abstractions used for a purpose. It's no surprise that he has many other images beside the canal. I mean, I, I don't mean to suggest that creative evolution could have just been a book about canalization with this one image at its center. Um, other images involve the wind that sort of divides itself at a street corner, um, a river that sort of uh, is broken apart into rivulets, um, the shell that explodes, of course, right? Uh, life is like an exploding shell whose uh, remnants continue to explode and fragment, Bergson says. And I think that what those images capture better than canalization is the sort of directional push or tendency or verge, uh, springboard of activity um, that canalization kind of lacks, right? Canalization, I think, does a good job of, of depicting how uh, matter can sort of narrow, focus, constrain, uh, and intensify uh, a flow. Uh, a tendency, but what it lacks is this kind of uh, activity element uh, of tendency, which I think wind better captures or an exploding shell better captures. And that kind of directional uh, inclination uh, is, of course, probably the essence of life for Bergson, right? Directional push. Um, canalization captures how that directional push can be channeled into different structures and how those structures serve to sort of provide it with a material substrate that then allows it to express itself um, in a function like vision. So yeah, I think it's no accident that there are many images. I think that this one image though has been unduly neglected in readings of creative evolution uh, and not uh, unduly neglected because it's important in its own right, but also because, I mean, through Whitehead, it is imported into embryology and it's just fascinating. And uh, as far as I can tell, no one is ever, I mean, this is a completely unnoticed fact. Um, so yeah, thanks for the question. I hope I maybe gave you- It was not a criticism, it was an addition because yeah, yeah. Uh, of course the canalization, the image of canalization is important. Yeah, great, okay. thanks, Ashi. Okay, thank you. So uh, the next, so Mojito raised hand earlier. So the next, Mojito, bro. All right. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Thank you, yes, uh, yeah, Sushi. And Tano, I have a first question for you, which is based on the image of canalization that you showed in your presentation. And also, it was very interesting to see that you have brought in Waddington. Uh, my question is basically this, that how is this image of canalization, if you can see a connection between uh, the use of complexity theory in biology, which has become very prominent nowadays, and how this focus on imagistic cognition that you have been referring to can uh, take us back to some kind of, uh, you know, can take us back to that kind of a trap which was mentioned by Burks on that this imag imagistic connection or cognition is important to understand life. But once again, it is extremely mechanistic because complexity theory is also based on algorithms. And once you are going back into that kind of a field, once you're going back to that framework of mechanism of understanding embryo and then from embryo understanding life, which is understanding the part and then trying to understand the whole, then there's a problem of appreciating life. Then there's a problem of understanding the dynamism of life, which actually begins from the whole and then dissociates into parts. So this kind of an association, which he mentions in creative evolution, which defines the role of mechanism or mechanistic tendencies is not the way to understand life, but it is dissociation and division and the points of differentiation, which can give us a very dynamic view about life. So my simple question in another, another, words, another way is basically this image of canalization, which is a way of understanding things. Do you see it has been dwarfed? Do you think it has been misused in some ways through complexity theory, which has been applied to biology and epigenetics? So that's my question to you. Great, uh, thanks Mohit. Um, I think that the 
danger of images is that you forget that they are just images, right? Yeah. So yeah. Richard Wanton um, in biology as ideology makes this point about uh, machines. We are so used to talking about the body is a sophisticated kind of machine that we forget that it's just a metaphor, or just an image that's not intended to exhaust what it's um, referring to. Uh, and I think, you know, does canalization run the same risk? Yeah, possibly. But what's so nice about canalization is that no one in embryology thinks that there is any such thing in the reality of a cell as a landscape, right? It's so obviously an abstract image that it doesn't have this risk of like fooling us into thinking like, oh, maybe cells really are landscapes and there's nothing mm -hmm. else to them other than uh, top topography. I mean, it's just, it's clearly a, a heuristic um, mm -hmm. that's supposed to help us understand developmental, um, developmental irreversibility and, and epigenic stability. Now that said, um, I think Bergson's considered view is that science is really just because of what its office is or its um, aims are, is never going to exhaustively capture the reality of and dynamic reality of life and temporality, which is why philosophy has a contribution to make. I think right. the uh, essay I, I referred to from Peter Godfrey Smith, he makes this point with respect to di uh, developmental systems theory, which is an attempt to sort of uh, capture more complexity in the field of development for scientists. One criticism it's attracted is like, how do we make it into a research program? I mean, if you take Erickson seriously, what are scientists really supposed to do in their labs? And Peter Godfrey Smith's suggestion is like, we can make a distinction here between scientists having to bracket some complexity in order to have a sort of experimental traction on what they're studying and the philosopher who doesn't have to bracket that complexity. So the philosopher can give a kind of robust, uh, rich account of nature that maybe can't really be put into practice in a research program in a, in a set of laboratories with a set of instruments, but that's okay because there's a difference between philosophy and science, right? The danger is in thinking that science can fully sort of encapsulate the philosophical insights uh, in the lab. Um, and I think canalization perhaps like you say runs this risk, but what's nice about it is that I think it, it's sort of pretty clear that there is no such thing as a canal in cellular biology. And so it like, it, it sort of shows itself as merely an image. So it's helpful, but it's not going to fool us into thinking that cells are really canals or anything like that. All right. Thanks for okay. the question. Yeah, thank you. Okay, so the question for Emily uh, is basically this, that you mentioned in your presentation about Hans Drisch. Uh, Hans Drisch, along with Etienne saint hilaire and Georges Cuvier, these three people represented an anti-reductionist view, which was totally dwarfed around the times uh, when this mechanism was taking grounds in biology and molecular sciences. So my question is basically since this, that one of the major part of your debate was, or the presentation was the debate between vitalism and mechanism. I would like to know what is the implication even now, because this question is uh, limited to, uh, not limited to you, but it is also going back to the question that I asked to Tano, which is simply this, that in Bergson, according to me, the point of focalization of everything that he has done in sciences in philosophy in moral is basically time. So why so much of funding and why so much of academic attention is provided to sciences over studying temporal rhythms of life? Now, according to Bergson, the answer would be very, uh, much cynical, which is that if you have to understand certain things, there is always a utilitarian approach to that. And sciences and research can provide us a way of doing that. Whereas philosophy is not paid that much attention to, or philosophy of time will never be paid that much attention to because it in some ways becomes a speculative enterprise. So my point basically is simply this, that this kind of genetic alteration that we are seeing um in food the or genetically modified um you know things like the organic food which is available nowadays throughout the year it's not something which is seasonal anymore uh, what kind of a moral implication is emerging even now with this kind of a vitalism and mechanistic debate which continues till this point in the sense that uh the kind of research and the kind even related to covid the kind of research that has been done very strongly uh, the idea of all this research is that we should be able to come up with a vaccine. 
but then nobody is really getting into this idea that why these kind of diseases are becoming so common why this could be not just the first pandemic that we may have to face in 20 years 21st century but this could be a series of pandemics which are about to begin so what could be the moral implication of still finding ourselves still finding our research between this vitalistic and mechanistic debate why have we still not been able to come out of that so that's the question to you it's, that's uh, quite a big question um, <laughs> and I, I must say I, I don't as a as a historian of, of biology I, I don't necessarily feel very qualified to, to answer that question um, but it is interesting to see that the um, I don't know about the moral implications but there definitely seems to be some kind of um, swing of the pendulum um that that you observe throughout the history of, of of ideas and throughout the 20th century in particular where whenever we go too far on to the side of of mechanism then it seems to it seems to swing back and there seems to be some kind of pushback and then the, and 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 then it swings back again and i don't know what that says um either but it's something that a lot of the biologists I, I've been studying have observed. But I, I, I'm kind of stalling because I really don't know uh, how to answer your question. I don't know if Tana wants to, wants to give it a go. <laughs> um, and I, I find it, um, I find it, I always find it difficult to answer questions pertaining to, um, to today. And I think I chose to study early 20th century history too, uh, as, a, as escapism. Um, <laughs> so I don't know if I'm going to be able to answer your question. <laughs> it's all right. It's all right. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So uh, yes, it's fine. Yeah. Okay. So the second question will be uh, Bruno Reitz. Uh, where Bruno? Okay. Hi. Well, thank you for both. It was amazing the presentations. My first uh, question is to Tano. So Tano, you said that, I mean, I was astonished because you made a, make, made a uh, relation with uh, epigenetics, right? At the end with Waddington. But precisely Bergson in Creative Evolution is criticizing Spencer's uh, epigenetics, right, model. And that's why he, he uh, sides with Weizmann against Spencer's epigenetics. How how could you answer to that to that question? So that's for for Tano. And then to Emily. So it's more like a personal question, you know, as because reading, I mean, finally reading the the scientists that use they that make references to, to Bergson, finally we have the feeling that uh, the real co contribution of Bergson philosophy, Bergson's philosophy to biology is to suggest some poetical images. You know, it, it, I mean, it, you, you, you concluded your, your presentation with that spirit. So, I mean, after reading all the bi biologists, even Huxley and, and, um, and, and other, Russell, do you think that they uh, actually thought that uh, Bergson's philosophy, the concept of Elan Vital or other points that you pointed were really important to their theories. Because finally, I mean, after reading these guys, finally, I, 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 I don't know, I, I have the feeling that they, I mean, they, they have this idea of, you know, poetic philosophy and then uh, scientific uh, assertions about life and the contribution is always in this field. So do you think, I mean, what, what do you, I don't know if I'm being clear, but you know, just a general feeling that I have. I don't know if you, if you share this opinion with me. That's it, thank you. Do you, do you wanna start, Emily? I feel like. Sure, um, this, this is actually a question I, I get quite often um, or in various forms. And one way of answering it is to say in the, so I guess it's something I didn't um, focus on here, but in the case of Huxley, there are kind of um, really precise ways in really clear ways in which he, he sees that um, Bergsonian ideas can be used um, even in practice in, in his uh, field zoology. Um, he, he kind of uses the the idea of of um, 
you know, of, of Bergsonian evolution of shared memory between um, between all of life uh, throughout its evolution to to propose a kind of methodology that would seem quite anthropomorphic probably to most, but by which we can kind of look at birds and and find um, some something that resembles what our own choices of mates, because he's interested in, in mating in, in, in these birds. Um, the choice of, he says that the, the female grebe choosing um, her mate, there's something of, of we can use what our own understanding of, of ourselves to, to kind of study these animals. And he situates that within a framework in which he's, he's sort of clearly been talking about intuition, Bergsonian intuition and, and this kind of thing. So there's, there are ways in which practically the, the, you find Bergson um, and I'm trying to, to add, it would be good to come up with at least one other example so that I could answer in that way. And there are, um, but then another way of answering is just to say that that's kind of the whole point um, is to say that um, the, I don't know if, I, I mean, I'm guessing quite a few of you have read um, Jimena Canales' book, The Physicist and the Philosopher, where she kind of unveils the dynamics leading towards our current state of affairs in which the authority of science is deemed superior and separate from all other areas of knowledge. And um, what she shows in, in her study of Bergson is that by taking his involvement in the intellectual life of the 20th century seriously, we can draw a more accurate picture of, of philosophy as not separable from a sort of the cultural and the philosophical not separable from um, from these scientists the ways in which a lot of these scientists were can were, were thinking um, and that's kind of that's kind of something that I, I find interesting and I, I think what is I, I don't think my aim uh, in my research has been to show that um, that there is um, something like a Bergsonian biology, a legacy in, in biology um, that lives on today, even though um, I think you could make a case for that. And I think um, uh, I think a lot of what Tano has been saying kind of um, goes in that direction. But I, th I think my aim was more to show ways in which we've been misreading um, 20th century science. Um, we've been looking at it through a lens that is that is the that is one uh, where we just assume that that um, that science and philosophy are separate because in the twentieth century specialization was already happening and so I don't know, I don't know if that answers your question but I guess it's just a question of what <laughs> what various what research what kind of research uh, I'm doing as well I guess um, Bruno Scott okay. Bye. Sure. Um, great. Thanks, Bruno, for uh, the difficult question. Actually, I'm not sure I have a good answer to it. Um, I think I just want to note that Bergson's rejection of Lamarck in Creative Evolution is uh, primarily a rejection of the idea that uh, individual agency has evolutionary implications. Right? And he sides with Weismann that there is a sort of continuity um, the uh, sort of like an invisible development of a tendency that is continuous across individuals. That's where the agency is, the creative agency. Um, and with a Waddington style epigenetics, I mean, the question of like, what would Bergson have thought about that? I think he would have been critical of the uh, geneticism, obviously, but I don't think it had, I don't think he would be critical for the same reason that he rejects Lamarck in Creative Evolution, which is um, again, for locating evolutionary agency and in individual behavior, because what's interesting in Waddington is that he's not, um, Waddington is finding sort of uh, developmental reasons for how in, uh, acquired characteristics might be inherited. And those developmental reasons um, aren't reducible down to like individual behavior in the way that um, Lamarck had it and in the way that Bergson rejected. But it's not a very well formulated um, thought on my part. I guess uh, the short answer is that 
I don't exactly know what Bergson would have made of Waddington. I suspect he would have been critical um, because in the end, Waddington was, of course, a uh, embryologist looking for mechanistic explanations. He, because he was reading uh, Whitehead, was attuned to development in a way that his colleagues weren't. And I think Bergson would have found that salutary because, of course, Whitehead's uh, attunement to development was Bergsonian, which is what I was trying to show in my paper. Um, so there is something nice about Waddington. There is something problematic about Waddington, just like there is with all science, uh, all biology from a Bergsonian perspective. That's a roundabout answer to your question, Bruno. Thanks. <laughs> I'll think more about it. <laughs> okay. So the next uh, mature talk. Okay. And uh, if you can <laughs> make it short, please. Thank you. Uh, okay, I'll try. Uh, my question for Emily is going to be quite short. Uh, I was just wondering if actually uh, addressed the problem of the critique person made to Darwin, and uh, if he, if he talks about it. Uh, but I'm sorry for Tano, I'll try to be short, but uh, well, I'll do my best. <laughs> um, and uh, sorry, trying to be fast, I forgot to say the most important thank you both for your presentation and it was uh, really, really interesting. So thank you. And um, Tano, I was uh, wondering, um, I, I thought it was really interesting to talk about canalization. Uh, but uh, I'm wondering uh, why, well, I understand why you decided to focus on the developmental uh, idea of canalization because today it, it's where the word is really used. But uh, I believe that in uh, matter and memory, uh, Bergson also thinks about how vision is different from one lineage to one to another. Uh, because of evolution. So canalization is not just in development, but also there is different canalizations in different type of evolutions. And so um, I was wondering if uh, you thought about talking uh, about uh, right landscape, right adaptive landscape that seems to also um, take into account the idea of canalization, even though it's not in embryology, but in adaptation and evolution. And uh, I'm, I'm speaking about it because uh, Wright's adaptive landscape seems to be more uh, processual, more adaptative uh, than, um, than Waddington's landscape that seems to be more static, more de deterministic. So I, was, uh, I wanted to hear you about that. Well, I just really quickly respond to the to the quick first question where um, I can't think of a um, I can't think of a direct comment on that, but um, there may be it may be that there is one. It's been a while since I've actually looked at Huxley. I'm constantly talking about him, but I haven't read him in a while. Um, so I'll, I'll definitely have a look because that's a really good question. And if I do find something, I will share it immediately with you. <laughs> uh, thanks. Yeah. Uh... Great question. I will also try to be brief. Um, so in my uh, like larger work, uh, forthcoming book on Bergson, I have a chapter on canalization as a way of making sense of evolutionary convergence. So why different species appear to be able to converge on the same solutions over and over again. So Bergson's view, I think, of canalization is actually not embryological, but like phylogenetic. Like there is a way that the tendency towards vision he thinks exists is canalized across different lineages, actually. Um, so different lineages sort of narrow and focus this tendency in their own channels. And that's why you have eyes in octopuses and the same uh, eye in, in mammals, right? It's the same tendency canalized across two different channels. You might think of like the same river being diverted into two different um, canals. Um, so that's that. Um, in this paper, of course, I want to focus on the developmental uh, dimension because of the Waddington trajectory. Uh, I haven't looked at Wright's adaptive landscapes, but I will. So thank you for that. Okay, thank you. So next, Chris Poole. Try, try short. Uh, your micro. 
Um, this is for 10. I'll try and make it quick. Um, but I was curious if you make a distinction between image as it's used in matter and memory and image as it's used in uh, creative evolution, because I, I, I read them as quite different beasts, but um, I'm just wondering what you might think about that. Yes, thank you. Um, that's a good question. Uh, I think that they're both parts of the same theory of images. I think that in matter and memory, um, images are um, always uh, narrowed sort of spatializations of something larger. So the perception image, of course, is a narrowed version of the material whole. And the memory image is a kind of contraction of the ontological past. And I think in creative evolution, uh, it's the same thing. It's just images do not refer to either the material whole or the ontological past, but they're um, thought in terms of scientific spatialization of more complex phenomena. So part of the paper that actually I think got kind of lost and part of my ideas that kind of got lost in, in the argument of this paper was to say that there is a sort of um, consistent systematic view of images that runs from matter and memory through um, sort of scientific abstraction view of images and creative evolution. I, I, mean, I guess I took uh, image and matter memory as a more of a grand metaphor for not necessarily vision, but uh, as a in, a in that metaphorical sense, it's both form and phantom, and that sort of it just sort of links a whole bunch of images which are affecting us. Um, whereas I, in creative evolution, it, it seems like more of an ocular kind of perceptual image. Yeah. But, um, that's a long conversation, but yeah, it's yeah, too yeah. long for. You. Uh, I'll send you my email and we'll we'll continue this by email. Thanks, Chris. Thank you. Uh, next, Larry McGrath. McGrath. Right. Thanks, Emily, for a wonderful talk. I learned a lot about it. I have two questions. How did um, evolutionary theorists deal with two concepts in creative evolution? The first is that the élan vital is given at once. It's finite. I've always found this idea very strange. I don't know why Bergson's so committed to it. So that would help me out. The second is how do Huxley and others, do they grapple with the idea that creation proceeds by disassociation uh, rather than association, which I think is uh, of course a key concept in his thinking. Um, I'm trying to think off the top of my head if, if, if any of the ones I've encountered actually do deal with either directly with either of these two concepts, because um, a lot of the time these biologists are quite selective in, in what they decide to, to actually address. And they are also, um, it's not like they're um, doing, they're not analyzing a philosophical text, they're, they're sort of integrating ideas into their own kind of musings. Um, I know that the two the two French neo Lamarckians that I very briefly mentioned they do um, they, one of them Pierre Paul Grasset definitely does uh, mention that life proceeds by division um, and I'm trying to remember in what in which context and I'm aware that we're running out of time so I, it's making me uh, it's making it even harder for me to remember um, but the um, yeah, so I don't, I, I, sorry, that's a bit disappointing. I don't really have a, a good answer for you. The, 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 the thing that, I'm, that strikes me is that they, not a lot of them go into deep, uh, deep analysis of the, uh, of the philosophical texts. They, uh, and that's not to say that they don't understand Bergson well. A lot of them do, but there's not um, this level of discussion, I would say, um, of, can, in the ones I've read anyway so far. Hmm. Sorry. <laughs> Thanks. So, uh, Emil, uh, thank you for waiting. So, it's your okay. time. Okay, thank you very much. Sorry for being waiting. Okay, it is about biological perspective, and my question is to both Emily and Tano. And uh, today we are talking about transhumanism, posthumanism. And, we, and it deals with our medical sciences, genetical research, genetical researches. And uh, this is the question, how can we today think personally the relationship between biology and technology or nanotechnology? Uh, was 
that you guess? I'm done. Thanks. Uh, Emily, I, if you have something insightful to say, I give you the floor. Uh, off the, uh, mm, <laughs> I'm not sure I'm, I can hmm, in, in do more than what I just did, which was mumble. Um, I can I mean, some throwing things. it right back at you, Tano. Thanks. Um, I don't know about nanotechnology in particular, um, but there's of course a view in creative evolution that uh, organs are basically technologies, right? Um, Kong M has a paper on this. Uh, that would be a place to look. But the view uh, essentially is that um, in species that are ruled by instinct, like insects in Bergson, um, their organs are deployed with functional purposes in mind. And in uh, organisms ruled by intelligence, like human beings, um, we can uh, use concepts and build machines that are basically like organs with a functionally indeterminate set of possible uses. Um, and that gets developed a bit in the two sources where he sees uh, machines sort of like providing maybe this possible liberation, um, but also at the same time kind of trapping us in a spatialized, uh, closed world where, yeah, we're dependent on our um, technologies. I don't have a well-worked out thought on this. How do we think in Bergsonian terms about uh, contemporary technology? I guess we should pay attention both to the sort of liberatory potentials that it might promise um, because there's no principled distinction between a tool and an organ. So there's no principled rejection we should have, maybe uh, a la earlier uh, anti-technological thinkers of contemporary technology. And, and at the same time, we should be uh, deeply suspect of the way um, contemporary technology maybe reduces the possibilities uh, in living or something like that. I don't know. That's pure riff. I'll think about it more. Thanks for the question. Okay. Thank you. So, okay, we have two minutes left. So may, may, I, may I have uh, I'm one short, very short uh, question to Tano. And uh, uh, do you have any any uh, idea about the, the possible, uh, um, how to say, so, so I, I'm, I have in mind, so the uh, downward causation or rather downward determination or other. So the, the, if you're, your 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 way of grasping the idea of canalization is the is uh, is, is, is is something inspiring to to connect Bergson's idea into the modern uh, discussion so about those kinds of uh, problematics so uh, if you have any idea about the possible validity or how how do you assess the the mo the possibility of those theoretical possibility. Uh, thanks, Yasushi. I unfortunately don't really have anything intelligent to say right off the top of my head, other than that I think with Bergson's account of, say, the structure of an organ <clears throat> being canalized by its function, I think it is a downward causal model, namely the uh, whole function um, is responsible for the way an organ's organized. And he says the further one makes in the direction of vision, like shoving your hand through iron filings, the more complex the, um, the parts of the eye will be. He also suggests at one point that it might just be that the eye looks to us like a complicated organ, whereas for nature, it's one simple fact. Um, Jan Kelovich says that in nature, seeing and the eye are two words for one thing, which I quite like, right? Because of our analytic um, disposition, our pragmatic disposition, uh, we grasp the eye as an extremely complicated machine, basically. And we think there might be many ways to affect vision with many different machines. Like there are many ways to build a mouse trap or an engine. But in nature, it doesn't really work like that. I mean, vision is the eye. Seeing and the eye are, it's, it's one movement grasped in two ways. And if you accept that at all, um, then you would be, I think, attracted towards a downward causal model where the function sort of uh, effect, sort of exerts causal influence on the composition of the parts of its structure that realizes it. Thanks.